are listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. three letters that have changed the food allergy world. Today, we're joined by Dr. Garfay, who will be answering all of our questions about oral immunotherapy. Dr. Garfay is a double board certified pediatric trained allergist immunologist practicing in Oklahoma City. She has firsthand knowledge when it comes to OIT because she practices it in clinic and has recently undergone OIT with her daughter. We couldn't have asked for a better guest to give us the ins and outs of what OIT is, how it is performed, the pros and cons, and what you need to consider if you're thinking about OIT for you or for a family member or friend. Before we jump in, two quick things. First, sorry about my sound. It gets a little robotic at times. We are no longer recording on Skype, so hopefully that won't happen again in the future. The second thing is you can get CME credits if you're a doctor by listening to this podcast. So if you listen, check out the link in our show notes and in our Instagram page to find out more about how you can get credits. And please, my friends, if you have been enjoying this podcast, if you have gotten something out of it, please share, please rate. That really helps us get to more people. Now, let's jump in. OIT. Hi, everyone. We're really excited to be joined today by Dr. Maya Garfay, who is in Oklahoma City and will be telling us all about oral immunotherapy for food. So thanks, Maya, for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So we're going to jump right in and ask you about your experience with oral immunotherapy and how long you've been doing OIT in your office. I have been in clinical practice for about four years now. And I did participate in some of the OIT research studies when I was in re- um, my fellowship training at Texas Children's. So I saw some of the back work of some of the FDA approved treatment plans that we have for OIT. So before we jump in any further, can we quickly define what OIT or oral immunotherapy is? Yeah, absolutely. So oral immunotherapy is we term it OIT and it's really referring to retraining the immune system to be tolerant. So no longer recognize something as foreign and in the sense of allergy, specifically in regards to a food. So and when we talk about immunotherapy, that's classically what people think about allergy shots when we're talking about retraining their immune system to not be allergic to, you know, grass or ragweed or those kinds of things through a series of shots. And those shots gradually, they start slow and low and so very dilute. And then over time, increasing concentration until you reach what's called a maintenance dose and then continue that until that immune system has not only been retrained, but established memory so that it's not recognizing an allergen as allergic, but rather tolerant. And so that same idea for foods is what we're doing with oral immunotherapy. So those foods are introduced to the body, typically through ingestion, but we'll talk about a couple different approaches, but gradually increasing with increasing doses over time until it reaches a maintenance. And the whole idea is that we establish instead of out the allergic state, you're establishing hopefully a tolerant state and then hopefully a desensitized state too. Maya, thank you for that great definition of what oral immunotherapy is in general. Can we just, before we delve into this topic further, just talk specifically about where we are in oral immunotherapy right now, specifically for peanut, for example, there's three different options out there and then for for the other foods where we are. So I think that that would be just a good place to start for everybody so that they can understand what 
oral immunotherapy is right now with the research and what practitioners are doing, at least in, in the United States? Yeah. So the three different options that you're you know referring to specifically is talking about the peanut uh, oral immunotherapy, right? So we have the peanut pill, Alforzia, which received the FDA approval, I believe, early in 2020. And so it's FDA approved drug, if you will, for peanut desensitization. It's actually, it's a capsule that contains peanut protein in it, and it's opened and mixed with soft food that it very much follows kind of a protocol, but it is easy in the sense that it's just a capsule. The patient's mom or dad opens it, parent opens it, kind of mixes it with food, and there's a specific protocol that they follow. And so that's an exciting approach for sure. And it is FDA backed up. So that's exciting. The other thing is actually a skin patch where the idea with that is that the patient wears it and gradually over time, the protein is absorbed. And we actually studied that at Texas Children's too. It was one of our Thing. So that was kind of cool to see it. That one is, from my understanding, very near FDA approval. So it's not quite approved yet. And then there's the oral immunotherapy that has been in practice for, I would say, roughly 10 years or so by some private practice allergists out in the community in the U.S. This is something that is not FDA approved. It's something that physicians, allergists are using, again, borrowing kind of the concepts and the mechanism of action of what's happening with standard allergen immunotherapy and using that same approach with foods. Those are for the most part, you know, they definitely are protocol driven, but each practice might do it a little bit differently. So for us, we follow kind of a protocol that has been established by a practicing allergist in the Dallas area. He has great data. He's been, he has been, from what I know, doing it, you know, one of the longest here in the U.S. And so we follow kind of his protocol and his guidelines here in our practice. And then as far as the rest of the country, I'm not too familiar with what everybody, everybody's doing it. Again, it's every allergist is a little bit specific and unique, but that's currently what's available for oral immunotherapy. Great. Thank you for helping us understand, you know, what's available, at least for peanut immunotherapy. And then can you go into then what's happening with the other foods? Yeah. So for the other foods, so from, you know, a research setting, I know that they're for sure tree nuts. I, I, I know, you know, those are on the horizon as far as, you know, in the academic setting, doing research on them and hopefully getting FDA approval. And again, in the clinical private practice world, those are the foods, the tree nuts, milk and egg, and some of the other foods as well are ones that are Again, not FDA approved, but using similar concepts as what we would base from peanut, we use the same idea with these other foods. And so starting with a small protein amount and then gradually increasing those, you know, I'll be honest, are not as there's not as much experience in them. And so some allergists are more comfortable doing the other foods and some truly aren't. So it's going to be kind of dependent upon your allergists and and their comfort level and what kind of their experience level has been with those other foods. So I'm just going to quickly paraphrase before we get into more details about what is available and what we're talking about is what's available for peanut really, because that's where all of the research has been done. And there's research going on with the other allergens, but what we're talking about is mainly peanut because that's basically what's been researched so far. So what I understand is there's the peanut patch, which is uh, also known as epi... Oh, you guys have to help me with this because I know it's like EPIT or something like that. So it's epicutaneous... Mm-hmm. immunotherapy. These uh, allergy worlds are like always a little crazy. So there's the peanut patch and then there's two different types of OIT, which is oral immunotherapy. There is the one that you would do in clinic, which we're going to talk about with Dr. Garfay a little bit more. And there is the peanut pill, which is also a form of immunotherapy. Before we jump into the OIT that you do in clinic, I just have a quick question about the peanut pill. Is that something that you would do also in clinic at the beginning and then you take home? Or is that something that a patient you could just take home and start right away with their allergies. And one question, is there an age restriction? Because I know that I couldn't do the peanut pill. Yeah. So the peanut pill, the, let me answer your second question first. It's approved for ages four to 17. You know, if a child is turns 18 while they're on it, they're going to continue it. But it's meant to start when they're between the ages of four to 17. The 
Palforzia, the pill would definitely be taken at the allergy office. So it's something that the, they would start and do their first day, you know, dosing in the practice and then continue the daily dose at home. And then each up dose of the pill is in the allergy practice. So it runs very much similar to kind of the oral immunotherapy that we do in our practice. It runs still the same risks. You know, you're still looking for signs of allergy, signs of anaphylaxis. And so absolutely it would be done, you know, in, in the practice setting. Not something I would just kind of prescribe and say, hey, take this at home. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> okay. I think that's kind of the thing is people think, oh, there's this yeah. peanut pill. I can just like pop it every morning with my coffee yeah. or something, which isn't the no, case. No, no, absolutely um, not. And yeah. With the peanut pill, is there an advantage to the peanut pill versus doing the OIT that you do in your office with actual peanuts? Is there a difference uh, or is there an advantage to one? So I think the big advantage is that it's just, it is standardizing the amount of protein that, you know, is being given, whether it be through the, you know, initial dose or through the up dosing or in that daily dose that the patient takes at home. The other thing is getting that, you know, FDA stamp of approval is really nice and just very for a lot of patients and families comforting and knowing that this is something that though it has risks i kind of have that fda stamp of approval but as far as you know the oral immunotherapy that we do in the office it's using the same concept so we're again regular exposure of a certain amount of the protein you know if we're talking about peanut peanut protein that's then increased over time, similar to the palforzia that they then would then continue kind of a maintenance dose as well. One of the biggest criticisms of palforzia is that it essentially is peanut powder that you can get in the store put into a pill form that you still have to break open to get the peanut powder out. So essentially it's just regulated amounts of peanut powder in pill form that you still have to break open. And so some allergists feel that this drug is very expensive for what it really is. And just for the convenience of us knowing exactly how much is in that pill and being able to kind of regulate it very closely, that's kind of what you're paying for. So for people where it's not covered by insurance and, you know, cost is a barrier, that's, I think, where a lot of people are having a hard time with it. So there's pros and cons to every um, method. And so we just want people to understand that, that one is not necessarily more superior to the other. And essentially it is doing the same thing, almost in the exact same way. So that being said, can we jump into what OIT looks like in the clinic? Yeah. So, so let's use it, for example, the peanut, since that's what, you know, we're comparing all of the different approaches right now. Let's use for peanut. So for peanut, I mean, oral immunotherapy in the clinic, the way that it would look is, you know, we confirm the diagnosis if we need to do that. And that would, you know, involve maybe a challenge. So some, some of us will prefer to do an oral challenge to the peanut before starting oral immunotherapy, just to really make sure that the patient is truly allergic. Once that diagnosis is confirmed, the first visit basically involves a series of several doses in the clinic. So they take a certain amount of peanut protein. And in the beginning, it's very, very, it's so small to the point that it's actually made into a solution. So it's actually taken in a syringe. So it's very, very small amount. And then that every 15 minutes, the amount of that protein is increased um, and the patient is observed for 15 to 20 minutes. And as long as they continue to be asymptomatic, so no signs of hives, no vomiting, no you know allergic reactions, then they're given the next dose. And that's continued for about eight doses. And then at the end of that eighth dose, if they have done well, then they're monitored for a whole two hours. So it takes about usually the full morning. I always tell patients to kind of plan on the whole day just in case they do have an allergic reaction. But so they're there from, you know, the, that whole morning. And then that highest dose that they've tolerated, they continue that same dose at the same time of day 
at home for the next one to two weeks. So generally, most of us have patients come every two weeks for their updosing. For some of the patients that really want to get through the OIT a little bit quicker, they may come every week. And as long as the allergist, their schedule allows for it, then they, they do that. But so they take that same dose at the same time of day, every day until they come back to the allergy office for their next updose. And then they continue that, you know, there's 12 total doses. So 24 weeks or 12 weeks, if you really were good about coming weekly. At the very end, we then do a challenge again to that highest maintain that, that maintenance dose, the high dose, but it's actually double that dose. So we you know, want to really make sure that the patient is fine with accidental exposures to not just the maintenance, but if it was a little bit more than that. If they have tolerated the challenge, then they have graduated OIT, then they, we would still recommend that they have regular exposure to that maintenance dose. What happens if they don't graduate the challenge? Do they continue up dosing or do they continue taking a maintenance dose for a while longer and then you challenge them again? Yes. So the second one. So we, the way we practice it is that if they don't pass the challenge, then we'll have them continue the maintenance dose for maybe another month or two months and then bring them back and try the challenge again. And if they don't tolerate the challenge still, which maybe is your next question, is then we may just have them continue that maintenance dose. So we may, you know, with with any point in the OIT, if they have been doing well with their updosing, but then they get to a place where they kind of don't make it past that threshold, then what we'll typically do is just have them kind of continue on that. Where, whatever dose they were fine with, just continue with that. When your patients are doing their maintenance dose, are you supplying the peanuts that they're going to be eating or can they use any old peanuts to create that maintenance dose? You're referring to like kind of when they're done with OIT? Yeah, there's a two-parter. It's like the two weeks where I have to go home and eat my maintenance dose. Is that supplied by you? And then afterwards, how do I know what my maintenance dose is? Because I'm probably not going to go to you if you are the one supplying it. It all boils down to what the amount of peanut protein is and that they have to have. It's, It's actually not so much having a spoonful of peanut butter as much as it is the amount of protein that you need to be exposed to regularly. So we give them a chart of this is the amount of peanut protein in this brand of peanuts, this brand of peanut butter, this brand of Reese's pieces and tell them this is your dose that you have to have. And then we just tell them to provide it. So it's not something that we provide to them. Our practice for the the updosing, so when they're coming in for the updosing, in the beginning, we actually make the solution and then the protein. So we have, you know, we got a big stock of the peanut protein powder, basically. And so they don't have to provide that. But I'll tell you for not for peanut, but for some of the other foods, like let's say we're doing um, cashew and pistachio, um, I will have the patient provide that, provide the the nut flours that we need for doing the desensitization. And then there are certain brands that have been kind of evaluated and you know correct or protein is contained per amount of that specific brand. Yeah, correct. Again, from um, our colleague down in Dallas who has done the research, uh, who's done, I'm sorry, OIT for the longest here. He has really done a good job, him and his team of kind of assessing that already. And so we know this is the brand, you know, of peanut protein powder that we're going to use going forward. And can you just tell us the name of that physician? Sure. Yeah. So it's Dr. Wasserman in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And he has a food allergy conference every year and he's published his data. I think that's been one of the things that's been really nice is that it is done on the private practice world. And so from the academic side, initially we weren't kind of seeing what it looked like, but once that data was published and we were able to see how it worked, how well it worked. That I think that's when most of us private practice allergists were excited to adopt this approach and offer it to our patients. I have one more small like technical question about the experience of OIT. You mentioned that during their maintenance dose in between, so these two weeks in between their updosing, they have to take it at the same time. Is that really important? Yeah. Again, that's one of those things where it's, that's how it has been done. And I think 
you know, when it's not done exactly the way that protocol is, then you run the risk of potential reactions. So yes, we really recommend that patients take their dose at the, roughly the same time of day. And then the other thing is that we really don't, we don't want them to get too overheated after taking the dose. So they shouldn't be taking the dose and then go run, do I don't know, some sort of practice, soccer practice or something like that. They really should be taking the dose and kind of just sit as still as a child can sit. But it's, you know, again, being practical, it's something that when they take their dose, they need to be really watched for the next at least hour. So that's something too, when I talk about OIT with patients that have food allergy, is just making sure that they're ready for that, you know, commitment because they they do need to kind of commit to regular visits to the allergy office and then at home really being good about taking your dose at the same time, being watched. So if a child is a little older and has lots of extracurriculars and all of that, just making sure that you're really fitting this into the day in such a way that it's safe and all eyes and all hands on deck while they're doing kind of the updosing for that six months. When we talk about this, you refer generally as a child or a teenager doing it. Is this something that only someone under 18 can do or can someone over 18 also do OIT? Theoretically, it can be done at any age, right? I mean, if we can try to induce tolerance and allergen immunotherapy, why couldn't we do it with the foods, right? But I think most of us have the most comfort in kids. And so, and the reason for that is, is that they really, their their immune system hasn't been avoiding the food for 25 years. It's only been for a year or six months. And so it seems that the younger the child is, the better their chance of kind of doing well with oral immunotherapy is. So yeah, I think for for most of us in my practice prefer to do the prefer to do it in children and actually prefer to do it in the younger ones. So, you know, even as young as a year, I I kind of cut it off at at a, or not cut it off. I will only start after they've passed their one year birthday. Then that's just kind of my, been my approach, but you know, some, some of them actually will even start a little bit younger than that. And then some will kind of wait until they're at least two. Again, the big thing is that the younger they are, they seem to do better. Great. Thanks, Maya. That's super helpful. So now maybe let's go into the side effects and things that people might want to know before they kind of consider doing oral immunotherapy. So side effects that we definitely expect to see would be typical allergic reactions or anaphylactic reactions. So hives, swelling, you know, difficulty breathing are all potential. I'd say the most common side effect that we see are GI system involvement. So stomach pain, vomiting, those kinds of things are definitely more reported side effects that I've seen in clinical practice. There's definitely one of the things that patients need to be aware of is that there's definitely a chance of developing something called eosinophilic esophagitis, which is actually unfortunate, something that I definitely talk to all my patients about, but that's something that is for sure reported with oral immunotherapy. What EOE is, is basically an abnormal development of eosinophils in the esophagus. And and this is what we think is from, you know, basically ingesting the food that the, that the patient's allergic to. So it can cause difficulty swallowing, heartburn symptoms, vomiting, belly pain, those kinds of things. The challenging part is that you don't know, you know, we, we don't know what came first. Did they have a little bit of EOE first? And then by having the swelling, what they're eating, did they then get more symptomatic? We're we're not, EOE is only diagnosed with a scope and biopsies actually of the esophagus. And so it's not like we're doing that on the patients before we start oral immunotherapy. But that is something that is a possibility. It does seem to kind of, once the therapy is stopped, the EOE does seem to go away, but it's something to be aware of. Do we know the likelihood of someone having an allergic reaction after completing their OIT? I mean, I don't think we do. I think that's the unknown. You know, the idea of doing the challenge after completing the OIT protocol and reaching the maintenance dose is that, you know, that they would be okay with 
hopefully the, that full maintenance dose and then some, but we don't really know. I mean, I think that's the kind of unknown. There's not this longitudinal data yet as far as OIT goes. Yeah. And I think that you discussed the common side effects of, you know, vomiting, nausea, all these kind of things. And I think for anybody with food allergies, normally, you know, as an allergist, we would treat those reactions with epinephrine. You know, if, if, a, if a child is exposed to a food and they start vomiting, we would tell them that that's a sign of a systemic reaction and they need to use their epinephrine. And so, Can you kind of guide us into what your protocol is for that? I mean, I know every allergist, I'm just going to preface this, is going to be different in how they probably guide you to treat these reactions and their comfort level in allowing you to wait a certain amount of time. But maybe we can just briefly discuss some of that. So if it's just vomiting, I think that that's something that we would say, okay, we're not tolerating this dose and we need to either stop oral immunotherapy or maybe retry on the dose proceeding. If they're having a, so I always say two or more organ systems involved. So if they are having the hives plus the vomiting, then I would definitely say to use the epinephrine, probably stop, uh, probably stop the oral immunotherapy. If they, if it's just vomiting, I think, so I think that's the hard thing is that just vomiting you kind of expect it. And so that would be, again, is it more on that EOE pathway or is it just kind of a side effect and not necessarily an allergic response? And so that's why I would have them kind of stop, try to try again with the lower dose or even, you know, cut the cut, go back a couple doses before and retry to work our way back up. So we've kind of touched on this next question a little bit, but can we just clarify what are the unknowns about oral immunotherapy? So I think the biggest unknown is really this whole sustained unresponsiveness phase. We know that, you know, we can get to the desensitization, hopefully, you know, by following the protocol and and following and continuing the maintenance dose. But I think most of us just have a question of how long do they continue the maintenance dose and how long do they have to continue that regular exposure to the food that they're allergic to in order to basically keep them from having an allergic reaction. So again, we just, we just don't have the longitudinal data yet on this. And it's something that I think over time, as we continue doing it, we will have that. But just right now, most of us who are practicing OIT, I think just would prefer to have the patient continue regular exposure to what they're allergic to, just, you know, to hopefully prevent any kind of big allergic reaction again. I think now the big question is, so if a patient is considering doing OIT, what should they know or what should they consider before starting? So the biggest things with considering OIT, making sure that you have, first of all, the time. So making sure you have time in your schedule, um, your work schedules, home schedules, school schedules to come in regularly one to two weeks to the allergy office over, you know, series of six months. And so just having that time commitment for the visits, uh, for the at home, taking the daily dose. So time is a big piece. The second thing is weighing out the benefit and, and risk. So am I okay with my child potentially having anaphylaxis? Am I okay with my child potentially developing EOE? Is that a risk that I'm willing to take in order to have the benefit of hopefully, you know, if my child at a class party accidentally is exposed to peanut protein, that they don't have a life-threatening reaction. And that is kind of the the interesting part, you know, now as a parent myself, I think about that. It's like you are essentially signing up to say, I'm actually going to put my child at risk of an anaphylactic reaction on a daily basis. Whereas, you know, normally you would be afraid of that, but your child would potentially not be as, as at risk as they are during oral immunotherapy. So it really is understanding the process, understanding what it means means and what it's going to give you at the end. But for some people being able to know, watch and go through that phase of worry, but controlled worry to get to the end state of not having to worry as much is really why I think a lot of parents decide to do it. 
Correct. Correct. Speaking personally, so my my oldest actually has a cashew pistachio allergy. So we actually just were almost done with OIT for her. She's she has her um, challenge this week actually for her last dose. She was diagnosed around 18 months with the cashew pistachio allergy. Around maybe three months later, she had an accidental exposure and had full-blown anaphylaxis, head to toe highs, became lethargic, had to use the EpiPen, I mean, the whole nine yards. And so when the concept and the idea of oral immunotherapy was made available to me and, and, you know, the option of doing it, it was definitely something that, you know, I've seen her anaphylax. I've seen her become literally lethargic and non-responsive in front of me because we didn't know what it, what she had ingested. So did I want to do that again to her? I mean, no, obviously I did not want her to anaphylax again, but did I want her to be able to have kind of that fear taken out for when she's at class parties or school parties and, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been incredibly rewarding for us. We, you know, yes, had to make the time commitment. Yes, had to, you know, weigh out the pros and cons. But now for her to be able to take, you know, her maintenance dose is three cashews and three pistachios a day. And for her just to be able to take that where literally the dust of cashew is what caused anaphylaxis back at, you know, 20 months. That's huge. And so personally, it's been very rewarding for us, but it's something that I have a timer on my phone every day to make sure that either myself or my nanny, you know, gives her her uh, daily dose. And anytime she complains of a bellyache, it's not just, did you go to the bathroom, but is she developing EOE? I mean, so those are the things that I have to go through in my head still, you know, at at this point it is still very rewarding. Thank you for sharing that. I think that is super important for people to hear that are listening to this, just to understand your perspective on it as somebody that's actually been through it. Can you do more than one food at a time with OIT? I mean, you can definitely do more than one food. Most of us, so again, there's different approaches. What we do is we do one food at a time. So you reach the desensitized state for that food and then move on to the next food. So it could take a little while. So let's say you're cashew pistachio allergic and peanut allergic. We would do peanut for the six months, reach the desensitization, continue that daily peanut dose, and then add the cashew pistachio desensitization. I do know that there are some practices that don't do it that way though. They kind of do multiple together, but again, that's that's not how we practice in, in our clinic. Yeah, because you mentioned that your daughter is doing cashew and pistachio. Yeah, so cashew and pistachio are kind of like food allergy cousins for the tree nuts. They actually cross-react. And so we do those two together. Pecan and walnut would maybe be done together, but separate tree nuts we would do separately. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like that was the one thing that we didn't discuss, but I know that there are multiple foods that you can do. So. So I was wondering if you could just clump it all together and be done in six months. <laughs> I think personally, the, the reason that you know we're not comfortable doing it is if you have a reaction and you're taking a handful of things, you know, you don't know really truly what you're reacting to. So it's hard to know which one you need to back up on. Yeah. And then, you know, the last final point that I think we can end on is just the reason that I think not every practicing allergist is doing this right now is because it is time intensive for both the patient and the the allergist or the practice. And it requires a lot of protocols in place so that the families have somebody to turn to when they have questions questions. And also I think uh, experience really helps in this arena and being comfortable with answering patient questions about reactions and when to have the patient administer epinephrine, when to wait, all of those kind of things does take time and experience. And so with time more and more practices will start offering it. But I think that's just something to keep in mind for people that are looking for somebody that they want to work with. Yes, absolutely. And it's not just dependent on your allergist, you know, availability and their schedule, but are their nurses comfortable with handling a vomiting patient in the office? You know, are, does the practice have a system in place for those frequent fo- phone calls from the OIT patient when they're having reactions at home or when they are sick and they don't know what to do with their doses or, you know, just the different things. So there's a lot of 
infrastructure things that have to be set in place in order for an allergist to also offer the OIT. Thank you so much, Maya, for going through this topic. I think as more research is done and as you know, we have more information, we'll probably have you on again to discuss this topic further because it, it is just so new and there's just so much that more that we have to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, this opportunity today. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. And also don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, or check out our website, which is www.itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week. 